Good evening, church. I want to say good evening to everyone. Um, at the same time, I want to appreciate the church leadership for this opportunity to bring the word to God's people this evening. Uh, I really appreciate it, and it's dear to my heart. Uh, sometimes some things happen, and uh, what we need to do is to take learnings from them and move on, become better, become sharper. As we look at the book of Esther, chapter 6, I'm going to uh, re-emphasize some of the things the previous speakers have said. Uh, the first thing is that the book of Esther do not have uh, God being mentioned in it. Uh, the second thing is that the book of Esther is a book that is ironic, uh, is dramatic as well, especially chapter 6 that we are about to look at. Uh, chapter 6 has a lot of content that makes it ironic and dramatic. Uh, the book of Esther, again, is a book that is, has so many reversers. There are so many reversers in the sense that uh, Amon was supposed, uh, Mordecai was supposed to be hanged on the gallows, but Amon was later hanged on the same gallows. Mordecai that was supposed to be hanged on the gallows was honored and celebrated. At the beginning of the book of Esther, we have so many discussions around the king and towards the end, the king was not really mentioned and the Jews were being mentioned more and more. Uh, the book of Esther begins with Susa being the location and it hands in Susa as well. Not like Nehemiah that begins with Susa and ends with Jerusalem. These are some of the things in the book of Esther. As we look at this book, especially the person of Esther was also a slave at the, at the beginning of the book of Esther, but became a queen within the book. So as we can see, there are so many uh, reversa, and the ultimate one that I'm going to point our eye onto is the fact that the Jews were expected to be annihilated at the beginning, like chapter 4. That was the plan. By the end of the book, uh, the Jews were celebrating because they became free. There was liberty. So these are some of the reversers in the book of Esther. As we look at the book of Esther together, I pray that the Lord will open our eyes the more in the name of Jesus. Shall we just pray? Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Lord, we ask that you will make the heart of your people receptive to your word. And we pray that you will make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. And you will write your truth, your word of truth that is simple, to your, to, into the heart of your people. And you will make your people to respond positively to your word. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. There are two great friends in the Bible, namely Jonathan and David. They are both committed to the interest of each other. Jonathan is from a royal family and David was not. Yet, they love each other. They are far from being unreliable friends, but very reliable ones. For one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who is still closer than a brother. That's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. They are both faithful to each other, despite one is from royalty and one is not. However, Jonathan protected David from being killed by Saul, and David looked after Jonathan's children long after he died. In today's passage, King Ahasuerus is from royalty, but Mordecai is not from royalty. Mordecai protected the life of the king, while King Ahasuerus honors Mordecai. The friendship story above 
between Jonathan and David emphasizes and embodies loyalty, faithfulness, and risk taking. And it is a replica of what Mordecai stands for in Esther. Mordecai's service at the king's gate was driven from a loyal and faithful art, while Amos was driven by a life obsessed with pride and a greed for royalty. People like Amon are full of self-obsession and pride. And we are going to be looking at this in details. Mordecai's service was at the king's gate. Actually, if you want to look at Mordecai's work, it's like a watchman over the gate, over the king. And if we put it side by side by Ezekiel chapter 33, the work of the workman, watchman in the Bible is a very... Uh, tasking one. You protect the lives of people. As we serve in God's vineyard, what is your motive for doing so? Is it from a humble heart or that people may know also that the congregation may say gracious things about you? As we ponder and begin to posi reposition our thoughts, would you like to follow me? As we walk down together in the book of Esther chapter 6. I'm going to be pointing us to a brief background about Mordecai. A brief background on two major characters of this chapter is needed. Mordecai was a Jew and part of the exiled Jewish community. He was the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. He was related to King Saul. He was related to some really he came from the lineage of the last born of Jacob, the Benja as in Benjamin. On the other hand, Aman is a descent, is a descendant of Agag, the Amalekite king, whom Saul defeated and Samuel killed. Amalek was Esau's grandson. Mordecai's, Mordecai's and Aman's ancestor at fought, and they continued that tradition. Hence, a primary reason, he did not bow down or pay homage to Amon. That's chapter 3, verse 2. And the king's servant at the gate reported him to Haman, for he had told them he was a Jew. That means he declared his identity. Chapter 3, verse 4. Amon was furious and disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Mordecai was the one that sinned against Amon, but he, was dis he asked disdain to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, they sought to destroy all the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Azeros. What a long-standing hatred for a people. Amon's disdain for him was great because he did not tremble before him to the point that such an attitude made his joyful moment sore. His joyful moment sore. It's one of the reversals that happened within 24 hours, and we are going to look at it. As a result of the rivalry and tensions between the two of them, the Jews faced extermination throughout all the provinces in Persia. And Amon planned to kill Mordecai in the morning while he went to speak to the king in the night about having Mordecai and. The structure of the passage is for Mordecai's loyalty is remembered. Esther chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, the king takes advice from Amon Esther chapter 6, 4 to 9. Mordecai is publicly, publicly honored. Esther 6, 10 to 11. Zeresh and Amon's wise men. Zeresh and Amon's wise men advise. Verse 12 to verse 14. Mordecai's loyalty is remembered. Chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. On that night, that Mordecai's death was planned. The king could not sleep. This is an apparent coincidence, 
and was not expected. The normal thing is when it is in the night, everybody sleep. But in this case, the king could not sleep. He ordered the chronicles should be brought and read before him. Was the king sure the chronicles would be a medicine for his insomnia? Is it possible for reading the chronicles to be a medicine? Maybe uh, Sarah will help us out in case we are in doubt. Definitely no. This is God walking in the background. A relatively minor incident, namely the king's inability to sleep, is of tremendous importance. It leads to Mordecai's deliverance from ridicule and ultimately death. God is providentially working in the background to avert death and honor Mordecai. He directs the affairs of men. Also, the king's heart is a stream of water. In the hand of the Lord, he turns it wherever he will. Proverbs 21, verse 1. Therefore, when you see the heart of the mighty and powerful of this world, being steered to favor you, know that it is not about your hard work or contributions to their success, but God working in the background to honor you. Maybe we are very hardworking and we think what we do is what makes people favor us. We might be making a mistake, a huge one indeed, because God ordered the heart of men to favor men. Men are gifts unto men to lift one man up onto the next stage. But God was working in the background to honor you. When the chronicles were read and a record of Mordecai's loyalty to the, to the king by saving him from death in the hands of Bikana and Teresh. That was mentioned in chapter 2 already verse 21 to 23, was mentioned. He asked what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this. The king's young men said nothing had been done for him. This is where his loyalty is remembered. And the king is perturbed because it is the culture of the king to reward, royal, to reward loyalty. After months, or before I move on, when God remembers a man, or when God steers the heart of men to remember you, God is about to act, either to bless you or to do something in your life at that point. In this case, the king remo- remember Mordecai. If we look at it, it's just like very synonymous uh, to Joseph, we can see Joseph 2.0 here. And the man said, now I remember my sin. You might think it is the man remembering. No, it was God putting Joseph in the heart of that man to recommend him to the king. And this is exactly Joseph 2.0. He said, this is where his loyalty is remembered and the king is perturbed. Because it is the culture of the king to reward loyalty. After months and years of loyalty, faithfulness, and saving the king from being killed, nothing was done for him. Yet he was consistently faithful in the king's gate. We see verses that refer to his faithfulness. Chapter 2, verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 10, and chapter 6, verse 12. 12. Lawyer at his work. How faithful are you to work to the work com- committed to your ends? Is he in church or places where you earn a living? How consistently faithful can we be? Primarily when no immediate reward exists. In the case of Mudeka, it was months and years and years. Some people might have been tired that this king I'm even dying for. I got a new name, a bad name because of him, yet no reward. But in this case, 
Mordecai was faithful. For some, there will be no reward in this life. Are we ready to be persistent and faithful? Abraham charged his servant, and the latter reported as follows. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I have walked faithfully will send his angel with you and prosper your way. That's Genesis 24, 40. This is a call to be consistently faithful at our duty post as Christians and ambassadors of Christ in God's vineyard and even the secular world. It may seem late, but Mordecai was remembered at a crucial moment. The second lesson is the king takes advice from Amon, and this part is very, very ironic and dramatic. Verses 4 to 9. There is yet another coincidence in this passage, but not merely a coincidence. Again, this is God at work. God is not mentioned in this book, but he is very active in the background and through the characters in the passage. As a man entered the king's court to speak to him about Mordecai, being hanged on the prepared gallows. The king asked who was in the court. The king's young men told him that Amon was there. And he said, let him come in. Don't forget, we learned in chapter 4 that before a man comes to the king, he must stretch forth his scepter. And when the person touched it at the other end. That was when he's expected to approach the king. If the king does not call you, he's dead. But in this case, it was reversed as well. The king's young men told him that Amon was there, and he said, let him come in. Can we check 6-3 together, please? The king asked him. So if we look at 6-3, you will discover an emphasis that I want to make there. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Nothing was done. The king asked him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? He's asking Amon now. Amon did not ask the king who will be honored. And the king did not mention the person in question. Hence, there were lots of unspoken words to each other. But he responded in his self selfish obsession and pride. For he asked himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Therefore, a man said to the king, for the man who the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought which the king has sworn, and the oath that the king has ridden, and whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and oaths be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. What a delightful, what delightful irony. What justice. What a story. How marvelous is the wisdom of God. You might think all of these things are happening, but it is God putting it at the right places, at the right time, from the right mouth. Indeed, How marvelous is the wisdom of God. A man came up with a plot to hang Mordecai, but God frustrated it. Indeed, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. Proverbs 5.12. He advised the king based on his desire, and a man's definition of honor means royalty because of his self-obsession. Overall, the law's purpose prevails. There was no time for a golden scepter to be stretched to Haman, like Queen Esther, when she had invited the king 
and Ammon to the banquet for all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces. Know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being caught, there is but one law to be put to death. Except the one to whom the king holds out this golden scepter so that he may live, a man had no moment to move against Mordecai. God did not give a man that moment to move against Mordecai. But he had every opportunity and every royal facility to enhance Mordecai's public honor through his advice. It was not enough that he, could, he couldn't speak, but was used to elevate Mordecai's status. Honestly, God again did wonderful things with his people. With wonder, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their designing men shall be hidden. Isaiah 29, 14. Amon was there to ensure his death, but unknowingly became instrumental in his public honor. And his evil scheme was humiliated with him. As Christians, we may walk and live in supposed safe havens or seats of power, but our safety lies in the hands of God. If not for God, Mordecai was a dead meat by Haman. As we reflect on our lives, are you obsessed with your life? with yourself. Is this self and, self and pride are element of works of the flesh and must be replaced with the fruit of the spirit? Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 to 23. Also thinking about God, also thinking about how God protected Mordecai. Do you think your safety depends on what you can do? Though we are to be wise in how we live, it is God who preserves our life. Our end doesn't come until he so decrees it. It is not by strength that one prevails. Our total dependence must be on our maker, even in our strength. And I need you to know that it is time to look up to God for help and your safety. Let this verse of the scripture, 1 Samuel 2, 9, continue to ring in us. It is not by strength that one prevails. Mordecai is publicly honored, verse 10 to 11. Let's look at 6.10 together. Then the king said to Haman, Ori, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew who sits at the king's gate. At the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Haman did everything as commanded by the king. The king's tone of action for Mordecai to be honored is immediate and urgent without putting the time of Didier into cognizance. All of these things between chapter, four, between, uh, chapter 5 verse 9 to the end of chapter 6 verse 12 happen in a space of 24 hours. And that is why this lesson is, is, is the heart of the, of, of the book of Esther. So it was immediate and urgent without putting the time of the day into cognizance. The king said, leave out nothing. He left nothing undone from his advice as God was working in the background to favor Mordecai. When the king said, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, he might be thinking it is Esther and a level of self-consolation might come with that until that phrase, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew, who sit at the king's gate. That's the last person he will thought the king will tell him to honor. That's the last person, because he's like his arch enemy. That's the last person he would, he would think the king will tell him to honor and take through the city. The latter phrase, do so to Mordecai, the Jew, who sit at the king's gate immediately resonated with hatred, wrath, and mourning in Amman. Your name may not, might not be Amman, but what name of a person or work in God's vineyard resonates with hatred or disdain in you 
as the latter makes you say, I can't withstand him, or I don't like being part of evangelism. Remember that these statements do not align with the scriptures, and there is need to make a U-turn unto repentance today. This is the pinnacle of their rivalry and tensions as Mordecai was publicly honored and elevated to royal status. But Aman, the second in command of the old Persian kingdom, was humiliated. Truly, God raises the humble and humbles the proud. Aman was proud and he was duly humiliated. The last part of this story. Zeresh and Aman's wise men advice, 12 to 14. This scripture prepared the ground for what happened in chapter 7. After all the honor and celebrations, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. This is indeed faithfulness irrespective of what you become. Mordecai returned to the king's gate. A lot of us or a lot of people, when they are elevated, honored, it will become too big to be at the king's gate. And if you look at between chapter 5, verse 9, and chapter 6, verse 12, it was mentioned again and again. An emphasis was placed on Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gates. Very important, very key to this scripture. He returned to the king's gate. This is indeed faithfulness, irrespective of what you become. But a man hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered in humiliation, defeat, and his ego, and his ego, self, was rubbished by the king. This is another reverser. 5 verse 9, he was joyful. By the time we got to 6, six verse 12, he was mourning. A man was mourning. Do you allow any status accomplished affect your faithfulness to God's work or from the one you earn a living from? He didn't for Mordecai. After explaining everything that happened to his wife and all his friends, the wise men, possibly two or more of his friends, that are wiser than the ones who advise in 514 because some, some friends who claim to be wise, but they are possibly foolish. They, they advise him in 514. But these ones, I think two or more of his friends that are wiser than the ones in 514. And his wife said to him, they said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him. They will surely fall before him. They were able to say this because they saw beyond luck and coincidence. Most times we use the word luck. There is no luck. It's God working for, for our favor. Most times we say he was just lucky. No. God is putting the right things in the right place for us. And it looks as if we know how to do it. It looks as if we are very, very smart about doing it. It's good to be smart, but God has his own place about elevating people. They perceive that the Jews were a people whom God is jealous over. We know he is a God whose covenant promises to his people are bound up with their faith. And though God's name is not mentioned in this book, he made all these coincidences happen. Hence, they predicted Amon's fall ahead of time. If Amon's plans succeed, God's plans fail. Therefore, Amon has set himself up against God Almighty. And this must be a lesson for us. When people are scheming against us, try and do your best, leave the rest to God and pray. He will handle them. I'm to, I'm 100% confident of that. He will handle them and he will not put the righteous to shame. Therefore, Amon has, Amon has set himself up against God Almighty. Amon was opposed by God for he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud 
but shows favor to the humble. James chapter 4, verse 6. How can the proud be helped? By submitting oneself. Pride, ego, self-obsession to God to be humble. Be humble and resist the devil. And this is the pathway to advancement and upliftment. As we look at the implications of the scripture and we start rounding up. The application is explicit in 6 verse 10, 12 and 3, 5 B. Do so to Mordecai, the Jew who sits at the king's gate. This is the biggest moment of this passage. And if it is what, if it is what our contemporary world, there will be an ovation and a citation in honor of Mordecai. Is that not so? Someone will be reading about Mordecai and be talking to us about the degrees, the honors, the Bible school he has been to. But it was not done. It's a quiet one and a humble one. Although Mordecai didn't initially make his identity known. Sorry, I'm so sorry. In all this event, Mordecai did not make any statement to humiliate the person and office of Aman. But he remained humble to honor God. Although Mordecai didn't initially make his identity known. Or in a similar case, ask Esther to avoid making her identity as a Jew known. Maybe because the timing was not right. That's chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 20. He told Esther, don't make your identity known for now. God's people are to make their identity known at the right timing and be consistently loyal in the king's business. And even all they do, no matter the nature of work. Also, when we are honored and possibly promoted, we must avoid arrival syndrome. Because Mordecai returned to the king's gate, he returned to his job descriptions after the celebrations, not allowing the joy of the moment to swallow him, to carry him away. God's providence over his people was very explicit in this passage. The enemy's plan over his people, I mean the Jewish community, was crushed and his power, Mordecai, was secured from ridicule and death. Another chance to life was given to Mordecai. Ultimately, for persons who are still obsessed with self, ego, and pride, that can only be subsumed in futility, another olive branch of life is extended to you today by Jesus, who is the giver of life. In him was life, that, that li and that life was the light of mankind. John 1, 4. Jesus wants to light up every darkness in you. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, Jesus is the way to real living. And we have life when we start living. And once we have life, we have eternal life. God's desire is that you believe and confess the name of the Son of God so that you may have eternal life. Will you wallow in sin, pride, and self? Or you will come to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Life is awaiting you this evening as you come to Jesus, Come to Jesus, dear friends, in exchange for life. A man, if not for God, he will have been perished. But God kept him from the shackles of a man. I pray that the Lord will help us as we continue to live our life in Christ. 